Welcome to Ham Radio Perspectives. I'm Quinn, K8 Queen Sugar. And I am Tom, WA9TDD. Here at Ham Radio Perspectives, we look at the intersection of ham radio, history, culture, and technology. We don't just review rigs and yada, 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 but instead we get into the depth of ham radio where we really don't know what in the world we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So here we are again, and this time through, we are going to talk about uh, a history, not the history, but a history of DXing. Spears to radio telescopes. Wow, that probably really throws you for a loop wondering what in the world we're going to do there. We got Jody Foster and some other guy running around. Tell us what we're going to do today, Tom. Well, you know, Quinn, it's interesting that humans still retain the uh, curious hunter-gatherer instinct that our distant relatives had. Uh, instead of searching for food and water sources or just interested in what's over the next hill, we search for contact with distant places, societies, cultures, and maybe time and space. Uh, sometimes we do this in person, but uh, with ham radio, most times vicariously. And uh, radio DXing allows the opportunity to explore, hunt, and uh, claim our distant trophies. Well, I tell you, uh, we're looking at DXing from a whole different perspective here, and it's going to be interesting, so stay with us a little bit. Here's a, an overview little outline of what we're going to do. We're going to define DXing, which, by the way, is not so easy to do. Uh, we're going to look at medium wave DXing, short wave, ham radio DXing, which we'll come back to more later, UHF, VHF, prehistoric origins of DXing, as Tom mentioned there. We're going to look at DXpeditions, the DXing community as a kind of tribe, and the future of DXing. We're going to do all of this in not too many minutes. We'll see how long it takes. Uh, and then we're going to come back later in other videos to some of these topics to uh, jump in a little bit more. All right, let's get started, Tom, here on Ham Radio Perspectives with the first one, and that is defining DXing. So here's our definition, searching for and identifying distant, note the quotes around distant radio signals, hearing and seeing via any mode and in any frequency spectrum. For hams, this usually includes two-way, but of course, in the history of DXing, it had to do often with one-way, that is reception, both hearing and seeing. So that's what we're looking at, is the history of DXing and how it leads into ham DXing. All right. and. Um our first DXer was uh, actually Heinrich Hertz, the discoverer of the electromagnetic wave. And he transmitted uh, from his transmitting apparatus a distance of 10 centimeters, which is approximately four inches. And in a subsequent uh, experiment, he transmitted a distance of one meter, that's roughly 40 inches, to his receiving apparatus. And that was a, a DX factor of 10. So it was a real milestone in the beginning in the history of uh, radio DXing. Isn't that amazing, Tom? I was thinking about this. So when I'm a kid and I got my new one tube transmitter that I built, and I, you know, if I worked a hundred miles on 40 meters, I was delighted. And on CW, you know, da 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 da, da probably throwing out uh, stuff on all bands at once. But <laughs> uh, you know, a hundred miles, and then you think of it, then going to a thousand miles. Wow, was that a change? And so here's Hertz coming in, and he's doing this factor of ten. It's quite quite amazing. So in a sense, he's the first DXer. But I have got the scoop on Hertz that you don't know, Tom. Well, uh, go for it. Let me okay. know what you. Let me know what you don't know about Hertz. Yeah. <laughs> he <laughs> invented the dipole. And you know where he got the idea? From his uh, transmitting apparatus. No, he got the idea from his mustache. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Right. Uh, uh, he didn't really invent the dipole. I just made that up. But I, I just couldn't believe this guy's mustache. It looks like a dipole, doesn't it? It does indeed. Uh, f fed through his, his nostrils. That will act, so, act as a well as 
you can, as you see in this apparatus here, transmitting apparatus, it does resemble a dipole. It does. T tell us about what the heck is this thing he used? Well, what he uses is essentially a spark gap uh, that produced, obviously, a spark between two um, two balls. And the uh, there was actually uh, the two horizontal segments created a dipole antenna. His receiving apparatus was essentially the same configuration, except that it didn't have the spark uh, generator, but it had received the spark that he sent from his transmitter and uh, created a sympathetic spark. So it was actually a pretty ingenious method. And uh, from um, what I understand from reading his history, he was transmitting on a frequency of 54 megahertz, which uh, coincidentally is uh, the TV channel too. So he's not only known as the first uh, DXer, but he's the first case of D TVI. Yeah, uh, yeah, he wiped out Channel uh, 2 everywhere. That's right. Uh, however, TV, uh, TV wasn't uh, invented until 40 years later, so he was actually in ahead of his time. Yeah, it looks like he invented the loop, too. And uh, Right. Amazing guy, Hertz. And, of course, uh, now we talk about kilohertz and all. When you and I were first licensed, it was all cycles, right? Kilocycles, right. megacycles. Megacycles, right. It took me a while. I still screw up and say cycles instead of Hertz sometimes. Well, if I'm looking at an older rig that was made prior to the uh, change from uh, cycles to uh, hertz, uh, the dials are marked in kilocycles and megacycles. So it's kind of interesting. Yeah, he was a DXer. I, I put this uh, in the presentation, Tom, just to get at an important fact here. This Spectrum Monitor magazine, and this is a fairly uh, recent magazine here. It's not some just some old thing. But if you look at the bottom of the screen, where it describes what the magazine is about. It says amateur shortwave AM, FM, TV, Wi-Fi, scanning, satellites, vintage radio, and more. So the idea here is to monitor the entire spectrum. And that gets to our definition of DXing, where you do this uh, wherever you want to do it. And I have to admit, I've never admitted this before, I think, to you, but I am also a Wi-Fi DXer. I make little Wi-Fi antennas and see how far away I can pick up my neighbor's Wi-Fi. I don't try to crack <laughs> in, but but it's amazing to me uh, with a decent antenna what you can do with Wi-Fi. True. I, I've done that. It's called war driving, where you drive around a uh, neighborhood with a, um, with a modem and see if you can tap into somebody's unprotected uh, the internets. So if, now we jump into medium wave DXing, which uh, most of us who are older hams, I think had a significant influence on us. So we're talking about the AM broadcast radio here, the medium wave listening. And this was this started up early in the 20th century amidst the nationalization of media. You know, So it's not just local media, but it's starting to be nationalized because you can listen to a distant station. So you're not just listening to the local town AM from the 1920s, at least through today, and from the so-called clear channel stations uh, to networks. And I remember the clear channel stations. I would pick up uh, KDKA. I think they were uh, out of Pittsburgh and KOA out of Denver. Now, this is from Chicago, growing up in Chicago. There was a station in Little Rock that I could p easily pick up at night and uh, WLS out of Chicago, of course, and others. But uh, uh, eventually the networks come in. And then what happens, Tom? Well, then what happened is the uh, syndicators got in after the networks <laughs> and kind of ruined AMDXing because you can go from station to station and uh, hear the same broadcast over and over again. However, in the early 1920s, commercial radio stations and the medium wave actually encouraged DXers to send in signal reports just so that they would know how uh, far their uh, station was being heard and how strong their signal was. So, Yeah, when we do a later uh, video on Q, the history of QSLing or verifying, we're going to look at that a little more closely, how, how stations promoted that. Uh, in the U.S., uh, we have, I believe it's 120 channels between 530 and 1700 kilohertz. Changes a little bit around the world, but 
Uh, medium wave DXing is still out there. It's still done by a lot of people. When it moved to network, uh, more and more network programming, I found myself having to be on a station, you know, when they would give their ID on the hour and then hope that I could pick up their ID because I couldn't distinguish local from distant stations uh, often the way you said. So NBC, the national broadcasting company, would put out these new statements. Uh, this is from 1928 about the stations associated with their network. And I cut this off so you don't see all the stations on the bottom, but very rapidly stations grabbed onto these networks and the networks announced which stations they had. Isn't this great, Tom? Look at this. This is the family sitting there listening to AM radio. Exactly. They're probably listening to uh, uh, the farm report. If it's early in the morning, if it's later in the evening, it's a uh, newscasts and uh, uh, serials, uh, the shadow, little orphan Annie and uh, dad there with his pipe and slippers and mom knitting and baby sister uh, reading her storybook. It's a, it's quite a Norman Rockwell picture. It is. It's just fantastic. And of course, once you started getting these radios in as kind of appliance like radios, then the temptation was not just to listen locally, but to be an average, let's say, middle class rising family and economic status and to go to that radio and start tuning it in and then to buy a little bit better radio so you could go off and pick up distant uh, stations in the evening, especially in the winter. And so this kind of AM DXing became a natural thing for many, many families. Right. And uh, in rural areas like where I live, it uh, was almost an essential. The clear channel stations, for example, WGN in Chicago, um, was able to reach into farm country here. The usual AM middle wave uh, station out here had about a 50 watt power level and had sundown to or sunset to sundown licenses, which means they were off the air at night. So you were lucky to pick up a distant clear channel station like WLS, WGN in the Chicago area, KDKA, so on and so forth, and uh, really enjoy yourself as uh, we now watch TV. And, uh, um, you know, like I say, that's kind of a real Norm Norman Rockwell picture. The automobile, hard to underestimate the role of the automobile in medium wave DXing because yet today, if you get in a car with a halfway decent AM radio and you get a little bit away from civilization, all of the RF noise generated by all the humanly created devices, it is amazing how well it works. And I love it. If I'm going out to pick up a grandkid or something in the evening, especially in the winter, and I got the radio on, I will turn it to AM. I don't care what's going on on, on FM and what the latest news is. I want to do some medium wave from the car. I just absolutely love it. And uh, what's interesting is the automotive radios have a higher RF front end on them than uh, most of the uh, appliance type radios. I assume that's because you, as you're traveling through an area, it would maintain contact with that station longer. But I've also noticed that I've used it uh, in broadcast DXing in the house, actually taking a Ford radio connected to a power supply and an antenna, and that outperforms just about any other radio on million wave that I've ever had. In fact, I have a ham friend right now. Whenever I go over to visit him, he's got his uh, his... his AM radio that he got from uh, one of these car part places, mm. bought cheap, and he's got it hooked up to a battery, and he's uh, he's listening around. Uh, I remember, Tom, that I, I think it was a 57 Chevy that my brother had, and it had a halfway decent radio in it. It kind of looked like this one. But he, his buddy, who worked in the store next to where he worked, who repaired radio and TVs, whose name was also Louie, my brother was Lewis. This guy was Louis. Uh, Louis had a Cadillac radio, an AM radio from uh, from a Cadillac that the guy never came back for after he fixed it. And my brother got that and mounted it under the dash in his Chevy. 
And what that radio had, I haven't been able to find this online yet, but what that radio had was a bar across the bottom. You touch the bar and it would automatically go to the next signal. And this was back in, like I say, about 57 or so. So he had this monster radio mounted down uh, over the hump, the transmission hump, you know, under the dashboard. And uh, I remember one time we drove from Chicago down to southern Indiana for something or other. And all night long in that ride, we'd hit that bar going to the next station. Right. It was fantastic medium wave DXing. Right. That was called the Wonder Bar. The Wonder Bar. Right. It was exclusive to Cadillac. Oh, man, you're amazing that you know that, man. I'm an automotive aficionado also. So Yeah, you are. Yeah. I know you got about 47 cars out on that uh, farm property that you got down there in, in southern indiana okay so and of course medium wave dxing is still big here's the canadian site dxer.ca and and what's that little thing there next to the radio um that is a uh, experimental ferrite dx antenna for medium wave it's uh, a barrel made out of uh, ferrite rods, which is uh, wrapped with uh, some enameled wire and a capacitor to adjust the tuning on it. And it affects the uh, internal ferrite core radio or ferrite core coil in the radio and supposedly uh, boosts the signal for, uh, for DX. Um, there are similar antennas just made of wire wire wrapped around a box and uh, probably a lot easier to make, a lot more efficient, and uh, probably a whole lot lighter than this unit weighs. Uh, you know, I, I, just... my, I myself, I have, I have a, a rather short 200-foot beverage antenna uh, connected to my internal radios here, and that thing works just absolutely fantastic for medium wave uh, DXing. Yeah, I was just going to say, I just cannibalized a uh, an older transistor radio that I could no longer get parts for or keep going. And I pulled out the little uh, ferrite uh, antenna uh, that's in it. I might use it for some other project. So this is a sort of age-old technology, but it's neat how people are really bringing this uh, back in, and, and a lot of them are hams. Now we go to from medium wave to short wave DXing, uh, 100 to uh, 10 meters plus. Radio, I call this radio listening amidst globalization, Tom, because in fact, what happens is shortwave really takes off when you get these shortwave broadcasters around the world and we can tune into them and get a sense like we're connected to these distant parts of the world. That's true. And uh, back back when uh, we were younger hams, the uh, shortwave bands was just, was just, just loaded with foreign broadcast stations, um, Radio Havana, Radio um, Moscow, Radio Netherlands, Radio Portugal. I mean, you could just go right across the band and put yourself in an easy chair listening to the news and views of virtually every country on the face of the planet. It was a fascinating time. And, yeah, and I um, used to listen to the uh, ham radio programs that were put on by HCJB right. out of Quito and Radio right. Nederland and uh, Radio Canada International had a nice one. This is interesting on this particular slide, though, Tom, because uh, this is part of a list of international broadcasting stations in the U.S. authorized by the FCC, which, of course, is a, is a U.S. Uh, regulatory body from 39. And you can see these stations here and the frequencies they're on, like the first one, W9XAA, Chicago Federation of Labor, which also did the WCFL oh, right. on uh, uh, on the regular AM band. And you can see the different frequencies they're on, the power in watts. So this was this internationalization was just going on like crazy. Right. And uh, W8XAL, the Crosley Corporation, that was uh, WLW out of Cincinnati. And at one time they had a temporary license to broadcast with a power output of 500 kilowatts. And their signal would blanket from the East Coast to the Rocky Mountains, from Canada into Mexico, and was even heard in Europe at night on the AM band. So 
there was a lot of experimenting going on and um, just just a fantastic. These were uh, each of these stations were actually middle wave, as you said. W nine XAA is now WCFL, uh, which is uh, now at uh, one megahertz, one thousand kilohertz on the a, uh, AM dial. Uh, WLW, and I don't recognize the other stations as uh, current uh, call signs. So, but you look at the power levels there. Crosley had uh, fifty thousand watts versus WCFL's 500 watts. So at this point in 1939, broadcasting was uh, really expanding. Power levels were going up and, uh, you know, DX was everywhere. And if you wanted to know what was where, mm. you got yourself a copy of the World Radio Handbook, uh, eventually called the World Radio TV Handbook by the time I got one. Mm. This is a, what is this, a 30... Trying to read that 56 Nine. edition. And uh, so this thing listed all kinds of stations and frequencies that you could then uh, use to help you find out what was out there. Of course, this is long before the internet, so you needed some kind of compendium like this. Here's an example from a page frequencies, stations, Bosnia, uh, Botswana, Brazil. And it says a little bit about these stations. And you, this is page after page after page with all of these stations. And it, it, to me, it was spectacular. When I had enough money from my paper route to get a copy of this thing, Tom, and be able to use it with my shortwave listening, I was nearly in heaven. Zenith, the long distance radio. And uh, Zenith was a uh, one of the forerunners of uh, early radio manufacture. Uh, the name Zenith actually came from a ham radio call sign, uh, 9ZN. And um, the founder was by the uh, name of McDonald. And he and two partners in Chicago started the Zenith Radio Corporation. And the... Uh, hallmark of their uh, operation was to produce radios that were good for DX. They were all advertisers, long distance radios, and their engineering went in to make sure that they, uh, that they performed very well. Their, um, we'll get to the slide shortly on the uh, transoceanic, but that was a hallmark of their long distance radio. Yeah, and this whole idea of making uh, dependable uh, was great with this particular ad. McMillan listens to Honolulu and New Zealand. Tunes in California, you know, from his little igloo there. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Okay, the uh, transoceanic. Uh, again, the founder of Zenith, uh, E.F. McDonald, he was an avid sailor. And he was disappointed with the lack of sensitivity of the existing portable radio. So in 1940, he commissioned his engineers to design a portable radio that would satisfy his requirements for both medium wave and uh, short wave while he was at sea. And uh, they produced this radio with it starting in 1940. They went out of production in 1942 during, uh, due to the World War II effort. And uh, they picked up the design again in, I believe, 1948 and expanded on it. And these right now today, these are very collectible. Operate on both AC, line power, and batteries, if you can afford them. Um, but they are very collectible radio. They are still very sensitive and very selective. Tom, I had a knockoff of one of these from a different manufacturer, and I'm I can't remember what company it was, but it, it was not very good. Mm. And I eventually got rid of it. Um, you know, of course, bought it used. But it's a fantastic looking radio, too. Mm. A little bit of classic design there. And the way that the front folds down and, and gives you the little map of the world. I just, I love it. What was the, it says on the top, makers of the famous wave magnet. I don't remember that. What was the wave magnet? Well, the wave magnet was actually a ferrite uh, a core 
wound with the uh, enameled wire, just like the uh, ferrite oh, core okay. antenna you, you had mentioned stealing out of your uh, portable radio. That was yeah. the wave magnet. Prior to that, prior to that, they used a uh, just a loop of wire um, embedded in the back, you know, cardboard panel of the radio. The uh, ferrite coil was a, a vast improvement over that, as that was able to concentrate more RF into the radio. All right, and here you are, Tom. This is this made you official from Popular Electronics Magazine. That is correct. W I had W P E nine F. DU. And uh, yes, this was uh, hung proudly over my uh, S120 shortwave receiver. And uh, I felt like I was really big time prior to getting my actual ham license. It, it's amazing, isn't it, that, uh, that a, a magazine like this would offer these certificates to kind of make you official, to be part of the tribe, right? the shortwave listening tribe, uh, with your own call sign and all, totally outside of regulatory uh, overview. I mean, it was just a fun thing to be able to do. I I think I got one, but I don't know what happened to it or what the call sign was. Yeah, I had one, and I believe you could get uh, stickers for it. They were gold seals that you could place on it when uh, you essentially worked all states, worked all continents, or uh, you know, DXCC Century Club. This is fantastic. It's a DX listening group headquartered in Japan. This is their little uh, newsletter. Remember what those uh, names? Yeah, the uh, Spanish. Yeah, Spanish out of Tokyo. La DXing Radio Radio Nuevo Mundo. Fantastic. I love it, man. It again it shows the internationalization. So ham radio DXing, amateur, I put quotes around amateur because we're going to do a whole show on what constitutes an amateur or not. Uh, you, you could make the case that amateurs are to some extent the, the real professionals, but we'll wait on that one. Amateur radio, point to point, so not broadcasting. You know, some of you are familiar with that biblical term broadcasting, to broadcast the seed out and then some, some of it grows, some of it connects, people pick it up. Uh, and so on, and some of it doesn't. So amateur radio, point-to-point -point DXing with distances expanding from intranational to international. Ham radio DXing, and this is a very important point. The rarer and more distant the other station, the greater, the greater the DX. And, and this sets the scene for how we think about DXing today. So somebody says, well, I, what were you doing today? I was DXing. So, uh, you know, you, uh, you're looking at distant stations, but also rarer ones. And so the rarity of a station and rarity of its location and the difficulty of connecting with it becomes a big part of what ham radio DXing is. And then we get into CB DXing. Hey, good buddy. You got a copy out there, man? Yeah, it's skip shooting. And uh, that uh, it still exists as a um, big activity in uh, CBing. Uh, yeah, I and you remember. got these guys that come up close, uh, into, close to the ham bands there on 10 meters. Right, in the 11-meter band. And uh, I remember back when I had a CB uh, mobile in my car back in the 70s, uh, there was talk about uh, guys with the uh, half-wave whips on the back of their trucks backing up to the aluminum uh, light posts and using it as a reflector. <laughs> Supposedly. <laughs> to, to work skip. And, you know, 11-meter band is not significantly different than the 10-meter band with the proper equipment uh, and the proper antenna. You know, you can you could work um, as any DX that you could on ten meters. So it's excellent, yeah. pretty fantastic. It's Since, interesting. Uh, it's, yeah, yeah. Today, me. Tom, I I was just going to say sometimes when I uh, tune on t uh, ten meters, there are no signals, but then if I tune down a bit in, into eleven, you you've got these C beers, uh, quote unquote C beers, skip shooters, whatever, who are there. So the band is open, and they're using it, even though the hams. Hams are not on. You can see a couple of QSL cards here. I When I went out looking for uh, QSL cards on the internet, Tom, for CB, I want you to know that I found a lot of cards 
and many of them, maybe most of them, were very politically incorrect. <laughs> I, I, if I had put those <clears throat> on here, I think uh, <clears throat> people would not be too happy with me. Okay, what about VHF, UHF, DXing? By the way, you're an expert on uh, uh, on weather. I know you've taken courses on weather and certificates and and on the atmosphere, so you go for it here. Okay, well, it's an, uh, uh, an effect called tropospheric ducting. When a uh, cold layer and a hot, warm layer of the uh, atmosphere creates a boundary, it actually creates like a duct in which a signal scatters and bounces and creates a, a pathway between two vastly different areas that uh, normally you wouldn't be able to communicate with. It's uh, kind of like a, a pipeline to make it a rather s simplification of the uh, VHF, UHF signal. And a lot of this has um, been noticed in uh, television. If conditions are right and you're in Chicago, all of a sudden you're dialing, flipping the channels and, you know, you're picking up a station in Omaha. But that was prior to the digitalization of TV, and uh, we still had analog. That's the That's the uh, that's the simple explanation. Yeah, that's the simple one. All right, now I'm going to pick it up a little bit as the academic. Sorry, gang. This mm. is this is where I move in with the uh, the academic stuff here. So the history of DXing. Now, let's go back to prehistoric. What in the world are these guys doing here talking about DXing and prehistoric? There is something built in to the human being, our createdness, the way we are as human beings, our species, that we like hunting for things. Uh, and we are all, in a sense, like prehistoric hunters. And DXing is an outgrowth of this over time. The hunting the gathering and the celebrating of the catches. You know, it's like going to a DX convention and doing a dinner and celebrating all of the things that we've done in our D expeditions and everything else. And so here you see these guys. These are some of the original DXers, Tom, and they're out there and uh, look at those antennas that they have. Right. Uh, I can't tell if those are phased verticals or uh, some kind of prehistoric Yagi, but uh, they all seem to be communicating uh, with themselves and uh, sneaking up on the caribou there, who uh, also appears to be sprouting uh, an even better antenna. So, it's, Yeah, the, uh, <laughs> the, the caribou are, are monitoring these guys coming in uh, right. on uh, their frequency. And yeah, also, you can see these hunters with their spears. In addition to the antennas on their heads, they have these spears which are actually elements from a Yagi antenna that, that, <laughs> that they pulled, pulled off and they sharpen the end and they're going at it, man. They're going at it. Right. And that one caribou looks like he's uh, sporting a tri-bander. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, and, and there's another ancient origin here, and that is in the human condition, our desire to progress technologically. Uh, we this again is built into us, and DXing is part of this to to become a better DXer, to go across space and time where nowhere has no one has gone before, so to speak, progressing technologically. And I remember Tom uh, sitting uh, the, up that night on watching TV when we landed on the moon, and it was kind of like a religious experience. Right, and as far as amateurs go, we have the. Uh... We have had and currently still have the orbiting Oscar satellites that act as repeaters in space. Uh, amateurs are conducting, uh, conducting moon bounce experiments. Back in a while ago, we had the Mir space station and the space lab that you could uh, communicate with uh, the ham operators on there. We have the International Space Station. Uh, many of the astronauts currently have ham license, so it's only a matter of time when Hams are chatting with other hams on the moon, Mars, and possibly other worlds. Yeah, in fact, here you got some guy from another world, and it looks to me like he's got a Chinese uh, handheld, Tom. That looks like a bow fung to me. 
All right. So uh, we're talking here about the history of communication, the evolution. Uh, and you see, it starts out on the left with the first written word. Actually, what that guy is not uh, putting words on that stone. You know what he's doing? He's he's trying to put in <laughs> put in a ground rod. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Must be and in he, New England. And, and he's about to hit his finger, yeah. putting that ground right in. Terrible. And then you got the movable type there, uh, uh, supposedly Gutenberg or somebody. But actually, he's he's putting the first vertical up. And uh, and then mass publication. So this guy, he's on his way to, to work. He's actually walking toward the train, which he's going to take downtown to go to work. And you know what he's reading there, Tom? He is reading from end to end the ARRL handbook. Okay, I thought it was maybe the technician class uh, license uh, manual. Yeah, no, he figures he doesn't need to know that. He's okay. just, and, and then the, you got the first DXer, and of course he's been at the rig too long, so he slumped over a little bit. He's got his seed cap on, he needs a shave, he's got a rig, he's walking along there, he's the first DXer. And then from DXing, of course, historically in the history of communication, we get in to the leading edge, the cutting edge right now of all communication, Tom. And you know what that is, Twitter. That's 100, 140 characters. And in fact, uh, he, he, uh, he got into ham radio and the first thing he did was jump into PSK 31. <laughs> and now he's graduated to FT8. There you go. And uh, so he goes back and forth. He's tweeting in ham radio. So there's the history of communication. And all of this is movement toward more and more DX. So now de-expeditions, scouting, traveling, and reporting. This is all about rites and rituals, de-expeditions. We need to do a whole show on de-expeditions, not just the history of it in the straightforward sense, but the meaning of it. When, here in Ham Radio Perspectives, we get into the meaning, the culture behind all of it. And this kind of scouting, going out there and scouting in new places and traveling to these new places and reporting from new places. It, there are rites and rituals, and it's all about challenging the limits of space and time, including weather, the accessibility of places and political boundaries and all. This is very, very important in the history of ham radio as a cultural phenomenon. And K4UEE, -E, a splendid, splendid uh, uh, what he does here. He creates these videos uh, well, such as uh, different de-expeditions. And uh, he he's part of, up, uh, I think, uh, 11 of uh, DXCC 10 most wanted countries alone and he, he's made these videos and I'll tell you these are important videos Tom and uh, the work of UEE -E and others are important because a uh, hundred years from now when they dig up the remains of North American society they're going to find these videos and look at these and say what in the world were these guys up to this is very important this, this was kind of a religious phenomenon back in its day true the expeditions uh, the expeditions and a little bit of history about the expeditions and uh, although the first shortwave radio was taken by various exploratory expeditions uh to maintain communication with their base camps uh, the first true amateur radio de expedition was in 1929 by harry wells w3zd he went to borneo to explore tropical and equatorial radio propagation and his first contact was with W6BYY in Mountain View, California. Talk about DX. Here's the guy in the middle of the jungle. He had three transmitters, receivers, batteries, and a portable generator 250 miles into the interior of Borneo, making his first contact to California. Simply amazing in 1929. And I think, to, uh, Tom, to some extent, we underestimate the significance of uh this kind of de-expedition work as expanding the frontier, the human frontier into places where people have not gone before and connections that people have not made before. Very, very important. Yes, it's a hobby, but it's beyond a hobby. It has to do with uh, the importance of human beings as innovators. 
uh, uh, Yasmi will say something just briefly in the history of DXing about Yasmi because it's so important. Uh, the folk tales, the folk tales of past adventures in conquered lands. Now, when I use the word folk tale in an anthropological sense here, I don't mean just things that are made up. I mean the stories, the true stories that are passed along from generation to generation, such as the Danny Wild stories and the, the, the Colvin uh, couple in their radio D expeditions. And uh, uh, Jim Kane, who, who wrote this uh, book on Yasmi and uh, uh, these stories is, is quite remarkable. Yasmi nonprofit started in 59 uh, with money to support a while VP2 VB, uh, VP2 VB, uh, uh, and Yasmi was the name of uh, Danny's boat, and then Lloyd and Iris took over for him after a while. Uh, in the 60s, uh, I'm thinking that, uh, let's see, the Colvins, Lloyd and Iris, I'm uh, thinking that they offered connections with over two, if I remember right, over 200 uh, DXCC countries. What a phenomenal story uh, in, in the history of DXing, really, and the DXpeditions. And, of course, DX contests and awards, rankings, uh, the human drive to compete for recognition through different contests and different sponsorships and all. A very, very important part of the history of DXing and the history of ham radio, for that matter. Uh, the uh, DXing community, I called it a tribe earlier, and I mean that, in, again, in the anthropological sense. There's a tribal identity, fellowship, and training. It might be, Tom, I don't know how to grasp this exactly, but it may be that the DXing community within ham radio in general is the strongest, most cohesive, uh, and best organized tribe as a subgroup within ham radio with their websites, their banquets, their organizations, books, periodicals, columns, ham fest gatherings. And, and we could go on and on and on with the importance of the DX community. Here's from the dxzone.com, uh, just some of the categories that you can look at, uh, you know, and research here, newsletters, prefixes, uh, QSL bureaus, QSL managers, QSO parties, shack rentals, so you want to go somewhere where it's warm and rent a shack, all the DX maps, foundations, calendars. I'm not going to go through all of this today. It's worth a video in and of itself, but it's very, very important part of the history of DXing. And then, of course, the publications, the books alone, DXing on the edge, the thrill of 160 meters, especially the thrill of getting an antenna up when you're living in a little city lot, the uh, complete DXer book. Uh, DXing the Easy Way, DX Magazine, uh, which is, I think it's uh, no longer with us now. Uh, the v UHF VHF book, Ever Higher Frequencies and New Bands to Conquer. DX Fiction, Treasure Hunting, Off the Coast of California Provides a Dangerous Adventure for Tommy Rockford, Teenage Ham Radio Operator. Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. I tell you, it's fantastic. And uh, the uh, author here, Walker Tompkins, Walker Thompson's, very important guy who did a lot of work uh, in his age, in his time, a lot of important work on writing about ham radio. He's got a whole series of uh, look, works that you can look at particularly a kind of youth fiction and uh, take a look Go on, on Amazon, let's say, and look up his name and uh, see what you can come up with. And you'll be quite amazed with all his stuff. He lived in Santa Barbara and uh, wrote quite a bit about Santa Barbara history and then wrote some, some great youth fiction on DX. I think it's an underestimated aspect of DXing that we don't much uh, get into, unfortunately. And the DX clubs, here's the Northern California DX club, very important group. I love their uh, little slogan here, tagline, we hunt DX, we work DX, 
and we make DX happen. Ah, yes, indeed, we do. Part of DXing. The future of DXing. What can we say about the future of DXing? There's a kind of rebirth in DXing, a kind of uh, rebirth that uh, hams take things that are already out there and improve upon them. They use older technologies as well as newer technologies. So, for example, we will do QRP using traditional modes, older forms of uh, uh, DXing that we move into new situations. Uh, we uh, look at new, new countries. We're reforming the countries. We're looking at uh, novel kinds of contests and zones and areas. So DXing is a long-term thing that gets morphed and changes. It's given rebirth all the time in new forms by hams. Really quite remarkable. Uh, I like this uh, fairly recent magazine here as an example, Radio User Cold War Special. And, uh, of course, it goes through all of the things that we think about historically, uh, the different kinds of DXing, but then it also does the new ones too. Uh, uh, pocket Radio here, a little review of the Reuter SDR and Cold War Special member number stations these things have been fascinating the mystery continues of number stations that have been around forever on shortwave especially where you pick up these numbers and you wonder what in the world are they doing so all of this has been around for a long time but it experiences a kind of of rebirth and then there's the future of dxing as innovation tom right um radio astronomy is um actually was um, participatory by a lot of hams, uh, not that anybody can afford a, a large parabolic antenna, but uh, there's a um, the search for uh, extraterrestrial intelligence. Uh, there is the Jove project, project, which is sponsored by NASA, that is uh, examining the uh, hydrogen lines of the uh, planet Jupiter. And uh, there's quite a bit of dabbling going on with radio astronomy among amateurs. Yeah, and always hams are out there in this technological edge doing new things. And that's why I say, do we just call them amateurs or are they a kind of professional sometimes as well? And a lot of this serves society and you could look at it as DXing uh, as well. So we included it here looking at uh, DXing. Well, we wanna give some special credits in this show uh, first to a Michael Nevradakis, who uh, we interviewed. He wrote a piece called uh, Disembodied Voices and Dislocated Signals, the World of Modern Day DXing. It's an academic journal article. I don't think you can find it online, but I got it from the research databases. And we interviewed him at, at some length and got some ideas from him. And we'll probably be doing a real interview with him later on some related topics. And then, Tom, the uh, Bartlett book is important too, right? Right. Uh, the ha World of Ham Radio, 1901 to 1950. It's uh, about 280 pages. It's available at the, a bookstore online. And um, it's a fascinating read. It begins at the very beginning of amateur radio, particularly DXing, and carries on through the uh, early 1950s. It's a fascinating read. There's a ton of information there. A lot of it is, uh, up to my knowledge, has been unknown. So it's a good book. I would invest in it and uh, give it a good read. Yeah, and it's uh, one of the few books out there that does this kind of social cultural history of ham radio, which is what we're doing. And unfortunately, right. uh, Mr. Bartlett is not with us anymore, so we can't interview him but, uh, but it's a good book and take a look at it. So we've been looking at the history of DXing. Our staff has included Alex Loop on audio, DC Powers, Quality Control, uh, Manny Watts, Sponsorships, High Gain, our diversity director, and he does diversity on tennis too. Uh, Rex T. Fire, Hospitality and Tranny Server. Uh, now, let, let me, uh, Seaver, uh, as in, uh, but not severe, as in, 
uh, Sevierville, where <laughs> Tentec was made. So these are some of our staff that have helped us on this show as we've looked at ham radio perspectives, where we examine the history of ham radio. We look at ham radio history, culture, and technology where those intersect. Please subscribe on YouTube, make comments, and, you know, criticize us, add more information, tell us where we were wrong. We love all of that stuff. Right, Tom? Absolutely. So thanks so much for watching this. Stay with us on Ham Radio Perspectives as we go where no one has gone before. Thank you so much. 7-3, everybody. Nor have they wanted to.